Live from New York City for our audience worldwide, Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, downgrading the economic outlook, the Treasury market rallying on weak data and credit spreads breaking out. We begin with the big issue. Here come the downgrades. Look at what's happening to the real economy. We're looking at an economy losing momentum faster than you know what we anticipated. Economists have begun to cut their top-down economic forecasts for GDP. This is a global story. Input costs have risen substantially. We're seeing demand destruction in some areas. The consumer is on somewhat more fragile footing. We do expect the Fed to hike rates more aggressively. The Fed has been driving the car looking through the rearview mirror. The economy is slowing and the Fed is saying that's collateral damage. Companies and consumers need to get ready. Frankly, we think they can keep going. I don't think they blink. We did see some pretty notable down, downward revisions. We expect more than great. And we have had a ton of downgrades in the last 24 hours. Joining us now to discuss is P. Jim's Greg Peters, FS Investments, Troy Gajewski and Kathy Jones at Charles Schwab. Kathy, first to you. I've asked this question a few times this week. We've had market volatility. We're getting economic weakness. From the perspective of the Federal Reserve, is that a feature or a bug? Well, I, I think we all agree it's a feature. Um, they've admitted that, you know, driving the economy to a point where demand slows down uh, to meet up with supply is the goal. And uh, implicit in that is the risk of a recession, rising unemployment. And they seem to be fine with that. They've adopted this sort of Volcker-esque approach that inflation is their, um, their target and their commitment to getting it down is unconditional no matter what happens. So I think there were some questions early on as to whether they really Really meant it. I think now the market believes that they mean it. Greg, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think uh, you have to take uh, the Fed at face value. And uh, I think the markets have been way too complacent the entire time uh, uh, around what the Fed is intending to do. So I think it's starting to finally play out in real time. Uh, and I'm not convinced that uh, uh, we're even close to the end of it. So, Troy, would you say it's too premature to price out hikes and start pricing in rate cuts? Yeah, it's still premature to do that for, for the reasons your other guests highlighted in that, you know, the Fed finally is trying to catch up from being woefully behind the curve for so long and is really aggressively moving or at least articulating a very aggressive path. And so, look, if you look out to 2024 or 2023, uh, the end of 2023, it may make sense to speculate a bit there. But in the short run, you know, focus on floating rate exposures that could still benefit from the Fed hiking and are extremely economically resilient. Um, don't try to be a hero legging into spread product quite yet. It doesn't hurt to nibble, but realize you're going to have more mark to market volatility. And if you can tolerate that volatility, we'd argue going after CLOs at close to 12% yield and double Bs makes a lot of sense in an environment like this. We'll get to those calls in a moment. A lot of this begs the question, Kathy, what on earth was the front end of the bond market, the front end of the Treasury market doing rallying so much this morning then and through today? If you believe also it's too premature to price out rate hikes and start pricing in rate cuts. Well, I've never been convinced that the Fed is going to hike as much as the market believes. Um, our, our position all, all coming into the year was, yeah, they were going to raise rates, but that it would have a, a pretty immediate effect on the economy and that they wouldn't be able to get to those three and a half, four percent um, area on Fed funds that they've been talking about for a couple of reasons. I think we have to take into account it's a global tightening cycle and a fragile economic cycle because of the energy shock. And energy shocks have been associated with recessions in the past. And, and also, besides the global tightening, draining liquidity so much, we have QT. And I know it's just started, but that's going to be the equivalent of probably another 100 basis points in tightening. So when you add that all up, does the Fed really need to go to 3.5% of the Fed funds rate? I don't think so. Um, I think that they probably will fall short of that. Now, they'll still talk a good game until they start to see the numbers that they want to see. But we're already starting to see the collateral damage in the, in the credit markets and in the stock market, all of that intended to tighten financial conditions. But I think at some stage, they will slow down this path of, of rate hikes and not get as far up in terms of um, uh, short-term rates as the market has been discounting. Hey, Kathy, you just said until they see the numbers they want to see. What are the numbers they want to see? What do you think they are? 
I think, um, well, we've heard Powell say a couple of months sequentially of declining inflation. I think the other number they're going to see is rising unemployment. So we've got a, a jobs number coming up next Friday. If we start to see the deterioration in the job market, that's going to give them a lot of reason to at least slow down the path of rate hikes. Greg, your thoughts on that? Build on what Kathy said. How far do you think this Fed can take things? And where's the tipping point yeah, so, in the mean, economy or in the market for when they take a pause and have to think about stopping? I don't think we know, right? So, uh, it, you know, this is very different. So it's contingent upon inflation. So I can't think of a worse scenario for the Fed if the economy is thrown into a recession and inflation remains high. So for me, like backing off because the numbers around growth are slowing doesn't matter. It's about inflation. They have to worry about inflation. So I what I also think there's a conflation between what people are saying around peak hawkishness and peak inflation. So inflation can come down, but if it's actually at a higher level than the Fed is comfortable with, that means they have to do more. And I think the markets are kind of putting those two together. As soon as inflation starts to roll, their job is over. I don't see it that way. Uh, the, you know, no one really knows, of course, but to me, uh, the risk is that uh, they have to do more because inflation is really showing signs of being much more sticky and broad based than initially thought. So, Craig, take that another step. With that in mind, how much pain is there still to come in credit? With investment grade spreads through 150, You've got high yield spreads through 550, almost at 570. Triple C is the junkest yeah. of junk. We've talked about that, a thousand basis points. How much pain is there still to come? Well, so I've yet to experience a credit market that actually uh, doesn't widen in a recession. So if you think there's a recession or a high probability of a recession, then I think there's more spread widening. At the same time, 150 in IG is at the long-term average. So you're at the average, right? And so the averages are a little misleading in credit because you have these spikes uh, and then it kind of rests and, and, and stays lower uh, uh, spread levels for longer. But to me, I think there's a lot more room for spreads to widen, uh, both in IG, both in high yield. The credit cycle hasn't happened yet, right? We haven't seen the hit in fundamentals uh, and that's uh, uh, on the comp. And yet what we hear, Greg, is it even if we get a recession, it will be a shallow one? Had a lot of messages about that this week. Just how much the consensus has changed through 2022. And just to go through some of the ideas that we started with and quickly got dismissed. The Fed won't hike much. Then it was the Fed won't hike 50 basis points. Then it was the Fed won't hike 75. The Fed will pause in September. Then we talked about a small chance of recession, a 50% chance of recession. And now the new consensus is recession, Greg, but it will be a shallow one. Now, walk me through what you think the risks are around that consensus view and ultimately what you think that means for credit. Yeah, you know, it's the pause that refreshes, which I struggle with as well. So uh, the, the depth of the recession, uh, I'm unsure of as well. I do think there's a lot of excess capacity that needs to get washed out of the system. So I'm not convinced that it'll be a shallow one. Uh, clearly, a shallow versus a deep recession matters a lot in terms of defaults and ultimate recoveries. Uh, but to me, we're not even at the point where we're, you know, pricing in a shallow recession. So um, it matters. Uh, I think it's really hard to play out uh, at this point. But ultimately, uh, we have to get to pricing uh, for a recession. And people are using this verbiage of a shallow is going to be fine. Get in now, I think, is way, way too premature. Troy, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I had more in Greg's camp in that you know, the thing we left out in this calculation for the Fed, and, and let's face it, it's a very challenging environment, the heterogeneity of economic outcomes in terms of sustained inflation with heightened uh, recession risk is unlike anything we've seen uh, really since the early 80s. Um, but the one thing we haven't discussed is the political calculation, right? And, and that was really what got the Fed finally moving. And clearly in D.C., there's a consensus that Inflation is a far more uh, prevalent risk than having a mild recession. In, in terms of mild recession question, you know, if you look back historically, somewhere between 75 and 150 basis points of peak to trough uh, GDP decline, real GDP decline, makes a lot of sense, which would still be relatively mild, nothing like the global financial crisis, but substantially worse than the recession in 2001. And if that's the case, you think about where e even if defaults stay relatively low, 
prior to those periods, which they should, given how much debt's been turned out and the relatively large equity cushions that are still in borrowers, um, you, you're still talking around 800 in high yield, right? It's very rare to have a recession where high yield doesn't hit at least 800 and then go up to 1200. So there is a potential if the Fed doesn't in fact drain their balance sheet overly aggressively, um, that high yield can uh, hold at around 800. But we're, we're a far range from that right now. We're far away from that. That's still you know, 200 basis points plus to go uh, if in fact we do have uh, a mild recession. If it's far deeper, right, then clearly you're talking more 1,000 to 1,200 and default rates will go instead of five to 6% trailing 12 month peaking somewhere more in the six to 8% range. Troy, I just wonder how forecastable some of this stuff is because, because part of any forecast is assuming you have an understanding of the Fed's reaction function. That's you right. just basically just said that this Fed's driven by politics. Now, if it's the whims of politicians that are gonna shape this Federal Reserve, then that concerns me. And I would ask the question of you, if you truly believe that, and I don't know if everyone does, but if you truly believe that, how do you come up with a forecast if ultimately the Fed's reaction function is shaped by politicians in Washington? Well, look, I, I wouldn't say it's the only thing they're looking at, but clearly the Fed over time has become much more politicized, and it really took pressure from D.C. Uh, to get them to start moving uh, more aggressively. Um, in terms of the forecast question, I mean, John, th this is arguably the hardest environment any of us have ever seen for making forecasts. I mean, think about how rapidly we went from higher inflation, whoops, inflation's peaked to even higher numbers, to, to what now looks like a much higher probability recession than anyone dreamed of as recently as eight weeks ago. And, and, and that's been a symptom of this entire cycle. It's not just been the magnitude of moves in terms of money supply growth, markets ripping up, markets ripping down. It's also been the velocity of change and just how fast the cycle has taken place. So you came into the year, recession was still looked apparently low. Um, before you knew it, it was rising significantly. At the same time, inflation numbers were making higher and higher highs. Uh, you know, stagflation is not our base case but it's also a scenario that you can't uh, categorically dismiss for the reasons you know. So very, very hard to make forecasts. You can point to various periods of history, 2000 to 02, where you have financial asset mean reversion to the real economy, coupled with some 70s style stagflation in there. And that's really the best framework to use when you're making any of these assumptions about how bad high yield can get, or how much higher rates could go before they go lower, how much equity multiples need to contract further. And then the question for equity multiples is what's earnings growth gonna be? Yeah. And clearly in the recession, you're not getting earnings growth. And that's still the bottom of consensus, which is somewhat amusing. I've spoken to Morgan Stanley a few times this week and they've been complaining a lot about the lack of revisions to estimates around the earnings story. I've heard that a lot this week. Greg Peters, Troy Gayeski, Kathy Jones sticking with us. Coming up the auction block where things have gone very, very quiet. That's coming up next. from New York City. I'm Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block where we kick things off over in Europe with volatility keeping a lid on activity this week. Sovereign issuance from Spain and the UK helping push monthly volume up to 89 billion euros. In the US, high-grade bond sales stalling ahead of the holiday, falling short of estimates for a third consecutive week. And in the junk bond market, issuance remaining stale throughout the second quarter. We have just had the slowest first half for issuance since 2009. Sticking with credit, Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo expecting the pain to continue. If you look at high yield, typically it, it peaks at about 10% in the cycle. Right now it's high eights. So I would say that's 10-ish, maybe somewhere around there, but nowhere near current levels. The Fed's looking right now at the tightening in conditions and saying, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it's painful, but this is a feature. It's not a bug. This is a feature. It's not a bug. Kathy Jones, I know you agree. Can you tell me when credit starts to get interesting for you? Um, well, I would agree with, uh, with Greg. It's, it's not time yet. It's premature. Um, we've been holding off on, um, on high yield and even on investment grade, just being really cautious there because we do think the economy slows down. We think it slows down a lot faster and perhaps deeper, I think, than the consensus. And although a lot of debt has been termed out, um, you know, this is not yet, uh, we're not at levels yet that's all that interesting. So, yeah, I would say high yield, at least, you know, 
850 over, uh, 750, 850, we might start nibbling. But again, it depends on um, where the economy is at the time. Wow. Greg, your thoughts on this as well, please. We've seen the wides of late 2018 taken out. In 2020, that was a problem. They had to step in, become max dovish. In late 2018, this Fed had to pivot. Clearly, they're not going to pivot this time around with spreads at 570. But one big bright red flashing light back in late 2018 was the primary market seizing up. Now, Greg, I'm not saying it's seizing up, but I am saying that we've started to see supply really come off. When does that start to become a problem, do you think, Greg? I don't think it's a problem in and of itself. So the backing off of supply has to do with higher yields, right? It's more costly for companies to come to the market today than it was six months ago. And then keep in mind, there's just been this deluge of supply. Companies have issued at a pace we haven't seen before. So they already have their liquidity. They already have their, their funding in place. There's not this maturity wall. So I don't think that's such a huge story uh, in and of itself. Uh, but, you know, to me, to Kathy's level, I think 850 is a great level. Anytime high yield has been over 800 basis points, it's, it's rewarded you handsomely. So that is a real level. The trick with fixed income is that you have these spike higher in spreads and yields, and it doesn't sit there for that long. And so it's really hard to capture. So as you get closer to those levels, you have to get more constructive. You have to wait in. Um, even if you're early, because spreads touch a level and they come down. Troy, when do things get interesting for you? Well, look, for the, for the time being, there's still interesting things to do in the senior part of the commercial real estate capital structure, given how economically resilient they are. But you're, you're not going to have the downside pain of further widening because they're private loans, and you will earn you know, somewhere between a mid to low high single digit return. So you want to be up in that northwest quadrant of efficient frontier in terms of as high yield and more spread product and interesting, they don't have that defensive nature. You know, I do agree 800 or above is typically a buy if you close your eyes at that point. Um, in the meanwhile, if you look at parallel markets like CLOs, you know, their CLO double B yields are up to 12%, five to seven year average life, right? That's a, that's a, a tremendous total return. Troy, you're saying this you, smiling. You've got to convince me a little bit better than this. You're saying this and you're almost laughing about it. Can you tell me the risks around this particular trade? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm smiling because it's a ridiculous yield in a very low interest rate environment where they're fully floating rate exposures. And, and looking forward, if the Fed does move like we all expect, you're going to benefit from that. The risk, of course, is you will have more mark-to-market -market downside, almost certainly. Um, so you have to leg in and be very careful as you do so. And then further out in the risk profile, if you look at tradable BDCs that are uh, 20, 30 percent discount to NAV, you know, majority of the assets are floating rate and you're north of a 13 percent yield. Those are the type of things that you can start to leg into as long as you can tolerate volatility in the event of a recession. We, we have focused a lot on recession, John, but that is not necessarily 100 percent outcome, right? It's one in three to one in two. There's still a non-zero probability that the consumer can stay strong, that we do get some business fixed investment. But clearly, the probability of avoiding recession has gone down dramatically. So you do have to expect uh, more downside potential. Greg, I just saw you shaking your head a little bit. Can I get your thoughts <laughs> on what you just said? Yeah. So, uh, Look, I mean, the double B uh, CLO trade uh, is really sticking your uh, head in the uh, tiger's mouth. Uh, you are super levered to the underlying collateral. You are extremely exposed to defaults and losses. To me, uh, that is where the pain is going to be. Uh, I see a tremendous amount of value higher in the capital structure. You can have a triple A CLO now at uh, 200 basis points. That is that is default remote. You have 38% of loss subordination underneath you. Uh, um, and so what we're doing at PGM, we are trying to kind of get out of unsecured risk uh, uh, into structured risk where let the structures and the subordination actually insulate you from the macro, which is weakening. Kathy, final word. Well, uh, I'm with Greg on this, uh, up in credit quality. Um, I'm also not convinced floating rate protects you that, well, it gives you enough advantage as an investor because, remember, those costs are flowing through to the borrower as well. So they're getting a dramatic increase in their borrowing costs. Uh, I think if something pays you 13 percent in a world where the risk-free rate is around 2, um, it tells you something.
Cathy Jones, Greg Peters, Troy Gajewski sticking with us. Coming up, still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, featuring FOMC Minutes and a big one next Friday. we got Payrolls Friday just around the corner from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread the week ahead. Coming up, markets close Monday, of course, for Independence Day. Long weekend coming up stateside. Ton of PMIs from China, the Eurozone, the United States throughout the week. FOMC minutes on Wednesday. Ton of Fed speak. And finally, we close out the week with Payrolls Friday. Just a note from JP Morgan, Mike Faroli, just downgrading economic growth. The following quote, soft economic data this week, leading us to revise down our tracking of 2Q real GDP growth from 2.5 to 1%. Our projection for 3Q, 2% to 1%. And I can tell you the Atlanta Fed GDP now GDP forecast, negative 2%. Best one to watch. OK, let's get to the final round, the rapid fire round. We can do that, of course, with our guests. Three quick questions, three quick answers. And I want to start with this one. Have we seen the highs on the 10 year yield for the year? Have we seen the highs for the 10 year yield for the year? Kathy, yes or no? Yes. Troy? 70 30, but more than likely, yes. Greg? I'm with Troy. 70 30, more likely, yes. OK, I want to see if this has changed. Fed funds, where does it peak? For the Federal Reserve, one handle, two handle, three handle, four. How high is this going to go, Kathy? Uh, three handle. Troy. Three. Greg. Three, but almost four. Okay. Last one on high yield spreads. Through 550 this week, in and around 570 the last time I looked. What do we see first on high yield spreads? 650 or 500? Up to 650, maybe through it, or back down to 500. Which one, Greg? Uh, 650. Troy. 650. Kathy. 650. We're all on the same page there, aren't we? Greg Peters, Troy Gajewski, Kathy Jones. So the three of you, thank you. Enjoy the long weekend. From New York City, that does it for us. We'll see you at the same time, the same place next week. From New York, this was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg TV.